Very excited to introduce uh, Father Nicholas Lombardo. Um, he's going to be speaking to us about emotion and virtue in the thought of Thomas Aquinas. Um, Father Lombardo recently wrote what I think is a really wonderful book <coughs> on Aquinas on the Passions called The Logic of Desire. And this book won um, the John Templeton Prize for Theological Promise. Did I get that right? Um, so his first book wins an award, which is quite an accomplishment. Um, Father Lombardo is Assistant Professor of Historical and Systematic Theology at the Catholic University of America. So please join me in welcoming him. When I would tell people that I was working on Aquinas' theory of the emotions, they were often surprised. They would ask me, did Aquinas write much about the emotions? A couple of times people asked me, did Aquinas have emotions? <laughs> and it isn't hard to see where these questions were coming from. Reading Aquinas can sometimes be like reading a computer printout. He cuts to the point immediately. He does not waste his time on pleasantries. He almost never lets his own emotions surface. He keeps his personality carefully sequestered from his arguments. That's not to say we don't see his temper flare on a few occasions. He calls out David of Dinant for teaching most stupidly, stultissime, that God is prime matter. He coldly denounces seizure of Brabant for corrupting the minds of his students. And after laying out his arguments against seizure's questionable co uh, cosmology, he challenges seizure, quote, not to speak in corners or to boys who cannot judge of such arduous matters, but to reply to this in writing, if he dares. But besides these rare outbursts of anger, his writing seems devoid of emotion and almost completely innocent of any attempt to incite emotion in his readers. So philosophers and theologians can be forgiven for thinking that Thomas Aquinas must not have had much to say about emotion. But as a matter of fact, when Aquinas finished his treatise on the passions in 1271, it probably constituted, by far, the longest sustained discussion of the emotions ever written. The treatise on the passions is the culmination of a lifetime of reflection and the centerpiece of a much larger project. His attention to the passions spans his entire literary output, beginning with his commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard and permeates every part of the Summa Theologiae. In the Summa, he thoroughly integrates his discussions of the passions with his metaphysics and his account of human nature, the desire for happiness, virtue, vice, sin, and grace. In its integration within such an expansive project, the treatise on the passions is without historical precedent, as is the Prima Secunde, the section of the Summa in which it is found. Aquinas' account of the passions also represents an original synthesis of every major thinker available to him particularly Aristotle, Augustine, Nemesius of Emesa, John Damascene, and his teacher, Albert the Great. And when his writings are considered under the rubric of emotion, a modern concept considerably broader than the ancient and medieval concept of passion, the scope of his achievement becomes even more impressive. Nonetheless, despite renewed interest in emotion among contemporary philosophers and theologians, Aquinas' account of emotion remains neglected. For example, Robert Solomon's anthology of classic texts on emotion, a standard textbook, does not include anything from Aquinas. Interest in Aquinas' account of emotion, however, is growing. Recent studies have made almost extravagant statements about his influence on later medieval and early modern thinkers. Peter King states that Aquinas, quote, set the agenda for later medieval discussions of the passions, such that later thinkers could do no better than to begin with his account, even when they disagreed with it. In her book, Passion and Action, the Emotions in 17th Century Philosophy, Susan James devotes a chapter to Aquinas. Of all the medievals, she claims, he exerted the greatest influence on early modern theorists of the passions, 
and perhaps even eclipsed Aristotle. Eileen Sweeney suggests that Descartes and Hobbes should be understood as, quote, reacting to and constructing alternatives to Aquinas' arrangement of the passions. Thomas Dixon's historical study of the categories of passion and emotion singles out Augustine and Aquinas as the two principal representatives of the Christian tradition prior to the early modern period. Furthermore, a number of analytic philosophers have offered sympathetic reconstructions of Aquinas' understanding of the passions. The revival of virtue ethics seems partly responsible for much of this interest, since Aquinas is one of the primary representatives of the virtue ethics tradition, and his account of the passions is closely connected to his account of virtue. There's been a similar renewal of interest among Thomist scholars. Thomist scholars have always looked to Aquinas as a primary point of reference on the passions. Nonetheless, until the 20th century, his treatment of them was neglected because the centrality of the passions to his anthropology and ethics was insufficiently appreciated. Neglect of Aquinas' treatment of the passions begins with Aquinas' contemporaries and immediate successors. And one of the ways we know this is from looking at extant copies of the Summa Theologiae. There are almost twice as many extant manuscripts of the Secunda Secundae, the section of the Summa concerned with specific virtues and vices, than the section of the Summa that includes the treatise on the Passions. The great medieval scholar Leonard Boyle thought that Aquinas' project of regrounding moral questions in a comprehensive anthropological context went over the heads of his Dominican confreres. Since the early 20th century, there's been a sustained interest in the passions among Thomist scholars and an unbroken chain of scholarship with varying degrees of attentiveness to non-Thomist philosophy and scientific psychology. Nonetheless, the great Thomist scholar Jean-Pierre Terrell notes that the treatise on the passions, quote, has scarcely attracted the attention of moralists. And in a paper given at the American Catholic Philosophical Association uh, at their annual meeting in 1997, it was observed that, quote, perhaps no aspect of Aquinas' moral theory has been more neglected than his treatment of the passiones anime. Despite the neglect of Aquinas' theory of the emotions, it is not an exaggeration to say that emotion is central to Aquinas' theological project. Aquinas' account of emotion centers on his account of desire. In turn, it is desire that gives the Summa its exodus ready to structure. Aquinas begins with God and then traces how creation flows from God's desire and returns to him through ours. Consequently, to follow the theme of emotion through the Summa is to follow the guiding principle around which Aquinas organized his most mature thought. The Summa is often compared to the great cathedrals of the Middle Ages for its vast structure and its comprehensive synthesis of so many component parts. Looking at the theme of desire and emotion is like stepping away from the many side chapels of the Summa and looking down the nave. Desire and emotion are not just central to the structure of the Summa, they're central to Aquinas' project and especially his ethics. For Aquinas, ethics is nothing other than the study of human psychology insofar as it flourishes or fails to flourish. Unlike approaches that regard psychology and ethics as two distinct categories that are only occasionally concerned with each other, or perhaps extrinsically related in a calculus where psychological well-being is weighed against doing what is right, Aquinas' approach offers a refreshing synthesis of psychology and ethics. In many popular understandings, there is something paradoxical about divine commandments. God gives us desires and then commands us not to act on them. For Aquinas, there is no paradox because God commands us through the desires he gives us. The commandments of divine revelation are ancillary to our natural inclinations. They are signposts to the fulfillment of desire. 
shorthand conclusions following from the logic of human nature. The positive role of emotion in Aquinas' theology derives in no small part from the cultural milieu of the Dominican order to which Aquinas belonged, even apart from the influence of individual Dominicans, such as his teacher Albert the Great, who had pioneered the study of Aristotle and the integration of theology with natural science. The Dominican order had grown out of an informal brand, band of itinerant preachers devoted to defending the goodness of the material world against the dualistic beliefs of the Cathars of southern France. These origins gave Dominic and his companions an especially acute attentiveness to the goodness of creation. And insofar as they established the government and basic structure of the order, and consciously and unconsciously shaped the distinctive traits of Dominican culture, their legacy undoubtedly influenced Aquinas toward a more pronounced appreciation of creation, one of the things his theology is often noted for, and therefore of emotion. His account of emotion then in part reflects the cultural dispositions of the early Dominicans. This genealogy underscores its rootedness in practical concerns and the analysis of ordinary human experience and also helps to explain its balance and humaneness. Now one of the major difficulties in making sense of Aquinas' theory of the emotions is that the word emotion has no direct parallel in the Latin vocabulary of the 13th century. Since the mid 20th century, scholars of Aquinas writing in English frequently identify what he calls the passions of the soul with the emotions, translating passio as emotion rather than its more literal passion. This translation is seriously misleading. While it is accurate to regard many of the passions that Aquinas talks about as emotions, Aquinas also speaks of affections that are not passions and yet clearly correspond to the category of emotion. For example, he speaks about certain kinds of joy or love that he explicitly says are not passions, but clearly should be considered emotions. Aquinas also writes about a category called the passions of the body that encompass phenomena that we would hesitate to describe as emotion, such as itches, hungers, and thirsts. For reasons that I will not go into here, I think that Aquinas' category of affection should be seen as corresponding to the contemporary category of emotion, not passion. Within his category of affection, we can see two subgroups. First, there are the passions of the soul, which are movements of the sense appetite, and therefore involve both the body and the soul. And these, Aquinas says, we share in common with animals. Second, there are intellectual affections, which are movements of the will, and therefore only involve the soul. And according to Aquinas, we share these in common with angels and with God. According to Aquinas, the passions of the soul and intellectual affections are tightly interwoven. For example, joy in the will, according to Aquinas, generally overflows to the passions of the soul. Now, I've, I've claimed repeatedly that Aquinas has a remarkably positive evaluation of the emotions. I also want to make the more specific claim that he has a remarkably positive evaluation of the passions. Some recent scholars, such as Thomas Dixon, have taken the opposite view, so I want to develop this point in brief. Aquinas also offers a very positive evaluation of the affections, but there is general agreement here, so I'll pass over it. Some texts can be used to argue that Aquinas' default attitude toward the passions is negative. However, these texts are few and far between, and they are vastly outnumbered by texts in which Aquinas clearly presents a very positive evaluation of the passions, some of which I will discuss shortly. We take too much time to parse the negative sounding texts and to explain why they do not indicate a negative evaluation of the passions. 
However, I do want to explain why I think it is easy to misread Aquinas on this point and why I think there's any controversy in the first place. The most helpful thing to understand about Aquinas is that he bends over backwards to show continuity with the opinions of established intellectual authorities, whether Jewish, Christian, Islamic, or pagan. In the writings of many pagan philosophers and patristic theologians, the word passion has negative connotations. But in the Middle Ages, these philosophers and theologians were considered by Aquinas and his contemporaries as authorities. Consequently, Aquinas goes out of his way to show continuity with these authors, even when he is subverting their conceptualizations of passion toward a more positive evaluation. And so in order to read Aquinas correctly, it's important to be attentive to his subversive project. As Bounty Kent observes, in his attentiveness to these innumerable authorities, Aquinas is quote, and it's a lengthy but delightful quote, Aquinas is very much like a host laboring to produce congenial, fruitful conversation among guests deeply at odds with each other. And like all good hosts, he conceals how hard he must work to ensure that conflicts are diffused and the party goes well. Sometimes Thomas repeats, approvingly, the words of an authority while giving them a meaning rather different from what the author intended. Sometimes he sounds as if he agrees wholeheartedly, when actually he agrees only with significant reservations. And sometimes his reservations become clear only later in the Summa, so that his earlier statements appear, retrospectively, in an altogether different light. And so when it comes to interpreting Aquinas on the emotions, it's crucial to take a canonical approach and to interpret any individual statement in light of his entire corpus. And when we take such an approach, his positive view becomes much more evident. These preliminary remarks set the stage to understand Aquinas' views on emotion and virtue, the main subject of this talk. Aquinas has a very complex understanding of the relationship between passion, reason, and virtue. This understanding is fundamentally positive. He sees passion, reason, and virtue as essentially aligned and complementary. Despite the possibility of internal conflict, Aquinas trusts the fundamental orientation of the passions, as well as their capacity to be guided by reason. His positive evaluation becomes more striking when we compare him with his contemporaries and realize that very consciously he is staking out a position that stands in direct opposition to theirs. For example, in the view of Bonaventure, his Franciscan colleague at the University of Paris, and I learned recently that Bonaventure and Aquinas would go and attend each other's lectures, so they're more than just happen to be there at the same time. In the view of Bonaventure, the passions lack either an instinctual, instinctual drive toward conformity with reason or an intrinsic ordering to human flourish, flourishing. For Bonaventure, the passions can be forced to submit to reason by an exterior imposition, but the independent dynamism of the passions for Bonaventure is an inherent threat to virtue. Bonaventure views the autonomy of the passions as a hindrance, hindrance rather than a help to virtue. For Aquinas, however, the passions are not a threat to human virtue, but an essential component of it. And the ideal relationship between the passions and reason is more fluid. Moreover, while the passions sometimes hinder the use of reason, sometimes they sharpen it too, since, quote, pleasure that follows the act of reason stre strengthens the use of reason, and moderate fear concentrates the mind. Consequently, for Aquinas, virtue consists not in the forced submission of passion to reason, as it does for Bonaventure, or the evisceration of passion into something manageable, but the rational ordering of our various faculties toward human flourishing. He builds his account of passion and virtue on this simple but controversial outlook. For Aquinas, virtue does not involve just reason and will, 
but also the passions as well. This view crystallizes in Aquinas' claim that the sense appetite, that is, the source of the passions, can be the subject, the seat or location of virtue. He classifies the different virtues according to the passions they perfect. Temperance is concerned with the concusable passions, fortitude with fear and daring, magnanimity with hope and despair, meekness with anger. Although he is developing a position held by Aristotle, it was controversial in his time. His contemporaries, including, of course, Bonaventure, but also Hugh of St. Cher, John of La Rochelle, and others, disagreed and located virtue only in the reason and the will. Their position follows from their view of passion as fundamentally irrational, just as Aquinas' more optimistic outlook follows from his view of the passions as fundamentally oriented towards reason's guidance. For them, the various moral virtues describe volitional dispositions to right behavior. But for Aquinas, the various moral virtues are holistic character traits with passion and reason inclined and mutually inclining toward our telos, that is, our perfection as human persons created in the image and likeness of God. Aquinas rejects the idea that virtue eradicates passion. If disordered, the passions of the soul may incline to sin, but insofar as they are ordered to reason, he writes, they pertain to virtue. Passion is not just tamed by virtue, ordered passion positively assists the execution of virtuous acts and, quote, helps the execution of reason's command. Even sorrow can be a mark of virtue when moderate and appropriate, contrary to Stoic philosophy. Likewise, the feminine expression of anger can also be virtuous, as in Aristotle's magnanimous man, who is open about what he loves and hates and in how he speaks and acts. Aquinas also has a sense in which virtuous passions impart effective knowledge that assists moral decision-making, so that the right choice is selected not just by a judgment of reason, but by the instinctual response of passion. Consequently, when it is well-ordered, intense passion is a mark of intense virtue for Aquinas. It indicates that the will is powerfully inclined toward the good and that the sense appetite has been thoroughly infused with right reason. The more perfect the virtue, Aquinas writes, the more it causes passion. The portrait of Christ in the Gospels is another important source for Aquinas' evaluation of the passions and emotions. Aquinas holds that Christ took on ordinary human affectivity for our moral instruction. According to Aquinas, Christ shows us what virtuous affectivity looks like, and therefore what it looks like to be truly human. Aquinas takes the instructive role of Christ's affectivity seriously, and sometimes mention it in the course of his uh, work discussing the passions. For instance, he argues that sorrow must be compatible with virtue because Christ experienced sorrow in the Garden of Gethsemane. And likewise, he argues that anger is not always sinful because Christ was often angry. This Christological influence on his theory of the emotions was not unidirectional. His evaluation of Christ's emotions often refers back to the treatise on the passions. At one point, for example, he argues that Christ could experience anger because anger is praiseworthy when reasonably ordered. Wrestling with Christ's passions and affections seems to have forced Aquinas to clarify his account of human affectivity in certain respects. For Aquinas, Christ is the model and exemplar of human affectivity. And yet, in order to understand Christ's emotions, he thinks that it is necessary to reflect on ordinary human experience and not just sacred scripture. In short, Aquinas' account of ordinary human emotions is in constant dialogue with his theology of Christ's emotions. And each 
reinforces the other's positive evaluation. Now today, when we talk about the morality of the emotions, we typically say that emotions are morally neutral in themselves. Now it's only in particular contexts that we can say that emotions are morally good or morally defective. And Aquinas is usually seen as taking a similar approach. According to this standard interpretation, Aquinas considers generic passion, that is, passion considered in itself, to be morally neutral or morally indifferent. Many texts support this interpretation, and it is accurate as far as it goes. For Aquinas, generic passion is a theoretical concept. It does not exist in reality, and it cannot be morally good or morally bad, because passion must be specified by an object in order to take on a moral quality. For Aquinas, it is not enough to know that someone is sad to judge the moral quality of their sadness. If someone is sad because a virtuous person suffers unjustly, the sadness has a positive moral quality. If someone is sad because a plan to rob a bank has been foiled, the sadness has a negative moral quality. However, this standard interpretation of Aquinas can be seriously misleading. It is true that generic passion cannot be either morally good or morally evil, but generic passion does have an intrinsic relation to moral value. For Aquinas, generic passion is normative for specified passion. Generic passion is the measuring stick for determining whether specific passions are morally good or morally defective. For Aquinas, moral goodness, psychological health, and human flourishing coincide exactly. And since the passions and their inner structure direct us toward our flourishing, moral goodness for Aquinas is the default orientation of generic passion. When specific passions follow the default orientation of generic passion, they are morally good. When they depart from it, they're defective. Consequently, rather than describing generic passion in Aquinas as morally neutral, it is better to describe generic passion as morally normative. The case of sadness provides a good example of Aquinas' methodology. Aquinas explains that it is good if someone becomes sad when confronted by a genuine evil. He writes, if something saddening or painful is present, it is good if someone becomes sad or feels pain because of it. For if someone does not become sad or feel pain in the presence of an evil, either he does not feel it or he does not count it as something repugnant. And obviously both possibilities are evil. Consequently, consequently, it is good that sadness or pain follows from the presence of an evil. Aquinas does not think it is good to be sad about an evil because there is a moral principle that, say, any sentient creature with a body should feel sad in certain circumstances. He thinks that it is good to be sad about an evil because he notes that we have a passion of sadness that operates in certain ways, and it is good for the inclinations of our nature to reach their fulfillment. He determines the moral quality of specific instances of sadness by measuring them against generic sadness, that is, against the essential structure of sadness. Aquinas' treatment of generic passion once again illustrates both his positive evaluation of the passions and his systematic integration of the passions into his moral theory. Rather than comparing particular movements of the sense appetite to some apodictic system of morality, and then determining the proper ordering of the passions accordingly, Aquinas roots moral judgments about the passions precisely in the appetites and tendencies of human nature. For Aquinas, the passions and their basic tendencies are not just oriented toward virtue and human flourishing, they are an indispensable norm and measure of natural law. Those choices that direct our passions toward their proper telos are morally good, and those choices that misdirect them are not. For Aquinas, natural inclination is law, and therefore so too is generic passion 
that is, the passions themselves and their inner structure. At this point, it may now be evident that Thomas Aquinas and David Hume share a certain amount of common ground about the normative role of the passions. Reacting against an exaggerated emphasis on reason among his contemporaries, Hume famously wrote, Reason is, and ought to be, the slave of the passions, and can never pretend to any office than to serve and obey them. Aquinas would have rejected this formulation as it stands, but both Aquinas and Hume see the passions as morally normative. Aquinas, however, allows for more complexity in his conception of both passion and of reason. Consequently, his understanding of how the passions relate to ethical norms is more nuanced. For Aquinas, there is not just passion, there is generic passion and specified passion, and only generic passion is normative. Reason should respect the inner structure, inner structure of passion, but not specifically not necessarily specific instances of it. Moreover, for Aquinas, the relationship is reciprocal. Just as reason must respect the inner structure of passion, so too passion must respect the guidance of reason. Because passion depends on reason and is oriented towards its guidance. First, passion does not arise apart from reason, for Aquinas. Passion is evoked by the apprehension of objects, and since such apprehension is influenced by rational judgment, so too is passion. Second, for Aquinas, after being elicited, generic passion tends towards the guidance of reason and depends on reason's judgments about what is truly of value when competing goods are at stake. So for Aquinas, passion has, nor has a normative role in ethics, but only generic passion and only in conjunction with reason. For Hume, however, there is not generic and specified passion, there is just passion. Furthermore, the impulse of passion arise, quote, arises not from reason, but is only directed by it. Consequently, for Hume, passion is normative in an absolute sense, and reason should submit to its guidance without qualification. According to Hume, quote, it is not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of my finger. It is not contrary to reason for me to choose my total ruin to prevent the least uneasiness of an Indian or person wholly unknown to me. Hume goes on to explain that our calm passions incline us toward conventional moral behavior thus rescuing his system from complete implausibility. But his account is nonetheless weighed down by his counterintuitive claims about the non-irrationality of such strange preferences. Aquinas' account, on the other hand, can explain why such preferences are indeed contrary to reason, even while affirming that the passions have a normative role in ethics. With these considerations in mind, we're now in a position to consider an intriguing question which has not received much discussion in the literature. What drove Aquinas to write his treatise on the passions? Nothing like it had ever been written before, and it is the longest treatise in the Prima Secundae. What purpose did it serve? What did Aquinas hope to accomplish? And why did he give the passions so much attention? One of the biggest clues comes in the Secunde Secunde. In the Prima Secunde, where the treatise on the passions is found, Aquinas prevents, presents an overview of human psychology and its development through virtue and its deformation by sin. In the Secunde Secunde, he builds on this foundation, offering a detailed description of how specific virtues bring the human person to full flourishing. And throughout the course of the Secunde Secunde, Aquinas refers explicitly to the treatise on the passions over 40 times. It's as though he had it constantly in mind, as though he is discussing various virtues and vices. Typically, he will refer the reader back to this treatise, give a short resume of the structure of a particular passion, 
and then compare it with the character trait he is discussing. When the character trait respects the passion's inner structure, it is a virtue. And when the character trait departs from passion's inner structure, it is a vice. From this clue and many others, we have reason to believe that Aquinas' central purpose in writing his treatise on the passions was to characterize the varieties of generic passion precisely so that the morality of specific instances of passion could be evaluated against them. In other words, Aquinas writes so much about the ontology of the passions, not because he is a philosophical overachiever, although he is that, but because he is convinced that the ontology of the passions is crucial to the morality of the passions. When I was first exposed to Aquinas' theory of the, the emotions almost 20 years ago, it sounded to me hopelessly medieval and distinctly unhelpful. But after entering into its inner logic, it started to make so much sense that I wondered why I hadn't thought of things his way before. And after hearing this lecture, if you're like me, perhaps you'd also like to see more scholars looking to Aquinas' theory as a resource, or at least engaging him as a serious contender. While I think that's something devoutly to be wished, we can take great comfort in the fact that, to a great extent, it has already happened. One of the surprising discoveries in my research was that over the past century, Aquinas has already played a hidden but enormous role in revolutionizing the philosophy and psychology of emotion. It is well known that over the past 50 years, both philosophy and academic psychology have undergone a cognitive revolution in understanding the emotions. And this is spread throughout so many different disciplines, literary studies, history, it's countless. Before, in both fields, emotions were considered intrinsically irrational. Today, the reverse is true. Most philosophers and psychologists now see the emotions as having an important cognitive element. What is now well appreciated, however, is that Aquinas played a hidden role in bringing about this cognitive revolution. In the field of academic psychology, Magda Arnold, who taught for many years here in Chicago at Loyola, is widely credited as being one of the pioneers of cognitive approaches to the emotions. Her massive two-volume work on the emotions, published in 1960, became a founding document of the movement. And Richard Lazarus, another pioneer in these cognitive approaches in, to, in academic psychology, relied heavily on her research. However, few people realize that Magda Arnold, a devout Roman Catholic, was deeply influenced in her theories by her reading of Thomas Aquinas and his philosophical anthropology. Meanwhile, in the field of philosophy, around the same time, just a few years later, Anthony Kenny published his seminal book, Action, Emotion, and Will. His book now ranks among a handful of key texts that are seen as pioneering cognivist, cognivist approaches to emotion in Anglo-American philosophy. And like Magda Arnold, Anthony Kenny, a former Catholic priest who studied at the English College in Rome, was deeply influenced by Aquinas. In his, in his book, Action, Emotion, and Will, he cites him frequently, often side by side with references to Ludwig Wittgenstein. The cognitive turn in the study of emotions has naturally paved the way for greater receptivity to Aquinas' theory of the emotions in contemporary philosophy and psychology. If we were still stuck in the theories of the early 20th century, Aquinas' theory of the emotions would never be getting the hearing it is now and in so many different academic fields. So ironically, without anyone realizing it, Aquinas seems to have prepared the ground for his own rediscovery. At present, there is no dominant theory of emotion in any discipline. However, the psychology and philosophy of emotion is undergoing a promising renewal, often welcoming rather than rejecting the pre-Cartesian contributions of ancient and medieval thinkers. In addition, many Christians are working to incorporate theology into clinical psychology and pastoral counseling. Although it should be noted that as yet, 
very little is being done to construct a contemporary theology of emotion. All of these considerations suggest that Aquinas' account of emotion is more relevant than ever. Few, if any, would maintain that his account as it stands could fill the current vacuum, and certainly I wouldn't. However, once integrated with modern science and post-Freudian psychology, its inclusive methodology, systematic death, and holistic approach might provide the basis for a new vision of the human person, culled and in conversation with millennia of anthropological reflection, and yet thoroughly accessible today. Still a gracious host, Aquinas continues to reward those who engage him in conversation, and his writings on emotion deserve a wider readership. Thank you.